Welcome to The Gut Show. I'm Erin Judge, registered dietitian and founder of Gutivate, and I will be your host. My goal on this side of the internet is to empower those with IBS and digestive disorders to understand their guts better, to have a healthier relationship with their bodies, and make confident choices to improve their digestive health. During this season of The Gut Show, you can expect a weekly conversation covering a hot topic related to health, digestion, and IBS. As a disclaimer, I am a dietitian, but I'm not your personal dietitian. Everything we cover in this episode is meant to be educational and not a substitute for personalized care from your healthcare team. Before we dive into today's episode, let's hear a word from our sponsor. Are you looking to add more prebiotic fiber into your diet? If so, Sun Fiber can help. With one scoop, you can add five to seven grams of soluble, non-fermentable, and prebiotic fiber into your day. This will help you feed your beneficial gut bacteria, help keep your bowels regular, and support your overall health. Talk with your trusted healthcare provider to see if this is the right fit for you. And then you can find your favorite Sunfiber containing products at sunfiber.com. You can also save 20% off your order with code GUT20. Now let's get into today's episode. Welcome back to the Gut Show. Today I am really excited because we're going to talk about your immune system. So the role of the immune system in gut health and the impact on digestion is something that I think used to be maybe controversial, but it's something that I see often in my practice. And with the newest research in even IBS, we're seeing a huge rise in our understanding of the, the interplay between immune system and gut And the gut is kind of part of it. So let's dive in with a little bit of background on what the immune system is. And then we'll talk a little bit more about how the immune system may impact your gut and how this can show up um, in your life or in the lives of those who are maybe dealing with both autoimmune disease or dealing with immune responses, um, immune reactions, and then digestive symptoms on top of that. And then we'll also maybe cover some areas where the research is going and some things that have yet to be fully laid out and uh, understood. Like there's not a lot of clarity there yet, but places where research could develop and some kind of places to keep your eye on, especially if you live with IBS and you're experiencing some of these kind of immune-like reactions on top of your IBS symptoms. So if we're thinking about the immune system, the human immune system is fairly complex and it actually involves different organs, different tissues, different cells, and even molecules that work together with the goal of defending the body against pathogens. So these could be bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites, anything that could possibly cause harm to the body um, and harm to parts of the body. Whenever we are thinking about our ability to prevent disease and kind of maintain health, the immune system is one of the key players in this happening. So if our immune system lets us down, that's where we're uh, able to develop um, sicknesses, illnesses, things like that. And oftentimes a disruption in the immune system can lead to a lot of um, issues down the road and and health concerns. So different parts of the immune system, um, one component is called bone marrow. This is kind of that soft spongy tissue that's found inside your bones. And it's most prevalent in like hip and thigh bones, like some bones more than others. And inside your bone marrow, you actually have blood cell formation. And that includes your white blood cells, which are called leukocytes. And these are considered kind of part of the immune response. Whenever you have um, an immune issue where your immune system is kind of called to the front lines, um, those white blood cells increase and they're part of that process. You also have your thymus. This is located behind your breastbone in the middle of your chest. And that's responsible for the development of specific types of white blood cells called T lymphocytes or T cells. Now these T cells um, are involved in cell mediated immunity. So whenever you look at um, autoimmune disease and immune research, you may see Um, people research like studying levels of T cells and changes there. And this may be part of that. We also have uh, other than these specific sites with with, uh, white blood cells, we have the lymphatic system, which is a major part of your immune system. This is a network of vessels, nodes, and organs that transport what we call lymph 
throughout the body. So lymph is a fluid that contains these white blood cells and other immune system compounds. So it's sort of like the transport system for these pieces uh, of the immune response that are then going to help with that defense mechanism, or they're like the defenders, if you will. The lymph nodes are important for filtering lymph, so filtering out that fluid and trapping any foreign substances that could be found from that fluid. So your lymph system is going to be activated whenever there is an immune response happening. It still active throughout, but it'll be more activated. And you may hear about this a lot when they talk about different lymph nodes in your body, you have some even your neck and you can, you can see them sometimes whenever they're swollen or whenever you're being assessed for an infection that your doctor may do a physical assessment where they press around and look for um, swelling of the lymph nodes. Um, and this could be an indicator that the immune system is activated. And then they may test for possibly white cell white blood cell count um, to see the degree of that um, immune response, which is an indicator of infection or a pathogen being present. Your spleen is an organ that is involved in the immune system related to the lymphatic system. So this is the largest lymphatic organ. So you have your lymph nodes, but you also have your spleen and it serves as a blood filter. So your lymph nodes kind of filter the lymph itself your spleen filters blood. And so it's going to remove damaged blood cells from your blood. It'll store the platelets in white blood cells that are there, and it can initiate some immune responses by detecting the pathogens in your bloodstream. So it does a lot of different things. Now your spleen is not something you have to have, um, but if you don't have it, you could see where some things could go wrong uh, when it comes to your immune um, system and how things are working together and kind of that recycling process, if you will, as well as a monitoring process. You have your tonsils and your adenoids as part of your immune system. These are the clusters of lymphoid tissue that are found in your throat and in your nose. Often people have these removed. I know I had mine removed a very long time ago. Um, they do help protect the body from different infections um, that are entering the respiratory and oral routes. Uh, so they are again activated and they're often removed whenever someone has um, inflammation of these frequently. Um, so repeat like tonsil tonsillitis. Um, I remember I had mine removed as a kid because I had a uh, tonsillitis, you know, two, three times a year. I'm allergic to a certain medication that's typically used. Um, and so they removed mine, but you know, the implications of that are really interesting to think about. Like, could that possibly have been a bad idea? I don't know. Um, it's something that is interesting, especially when we start adding up the different parts of the immune system and these organs that, that have been removed for people. So in addition to all these things, we have our lymphocytes, which are those white blood cells that we already talked about. And these play more of a central role in the immune process. So remember, they are transported as like those main defenders and you have your B cells and your T cells. So your B cells are the ones that come from your bone marrow um, and they mature in the bone marrow or the spleen. And those actually produce antibodies, which are proteins that can recognize and neutral pathogens. So you develop antibodies in a way to start killing things. So oftentimes when we're looking at autoimmune disease, we actually can assess antibodies to see where there may be this kind of killing process or autoimmune process happening. Um, some examples of this would be with even the development of IBS post um, infection, we develop what's called anti vinculin and anti CDTB antibodies. And these antibodies can have these other effects. They start to attack the body um, and then they can lead to a disruption in the gut microbiome, bacterial overgrowth and altered immune activation, increased permeability. So there's a lot of downstream effects that come from the body trying to kind of preserve itself and, and find safety um, in killing the potential pathogen. With um, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, we have the development of TPO antibodies and these are then you know, utilized in, in that process with the thyroid function. It can lead to kind of this chronic low levels of hypothyroidism. Um, so those are just some examples. We also have T cells, uh, which you know earlier we talked about those being matured in the thymus. And there are several types of these. 
not really important to, to kind of note exactly who, who they are, but you'll see them um, throughout, again, literature, if you're reading um, different research or studying this more and specific autoimmune conditions and, and what's being studied there. These will all um, play a role in coordinating and executing different immune responses in the body. So again, they're kind of like that defense system, like the Marines or the Navy SEALs that are going out um, and, and really uh, organizing and initiating the um, attack, if you will. So we do have other antibodies um, that go beyond just the B cells, and these can be called immunoglobulins. These are Y-shaped proteins. So antibodies are typically always proteins, um, so different shape, and these are actually produced by your B cells. So you have your B cells, which function like antibodies, and they produce these immunoglobulins, which are antibodies, <laughs> which is a long process, right? It's like antibodies on antibodies on antibodies, and this process can keep happening, right? So if you have a rapid increase in these B cells, and then they're producing lots of antibodies, and then those antibodies are killing, and then there's more antibodies, that, that process can get a little out of control. Um, and each antibody is going to be specific to a pathogen. And then they work together by kind of binding to the pathogen and then marking it for destruction. So they are there to make sure things get killed off, whether that thing being killed is a true pathogen, which is the goal, or it's not, which would be autoimmune disease that we typically will see. So when it comes to actual destruction of the pathogens and anything related to that, we have our phagocytes. These are some white blood cells um, that are really destroyers. So again, think about the military. These are like your frontline combat, you know, military people. Phagocytes can either be neutrophils, monocytes, or macrophages, um, and they're all involved in different ways to kill different things. Um, there's a lot of research being developed around these, especially the use of macrophages and different phages in terms of removing like um, pathogens in the gut. So one example is that we see with like SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and even some overgrowth in certain IBS patients where there's an overgrowth of these semi-pathogenic bacteria. And so one thought of eradicating this would be to use phages that are there to kill them, right? We do that with even cancer treatment where those cancer cells are rapidly multiplying. And so a lot of treatments are aimed at, okay, let's go in and kill those cells so that they will stop multiplying, you know, and, and um, continuing, right? Their growth will slow, we can um, bring it down. So there's a lot of talk about that. Um, it hasn't been used yet who knows if that's where things will go and is there danger right even what we see with um, like chemo and different cancer treatments is when we go in to kill cells sometimes healthy cells also get killed in the process and even in the immune system process well yes certain antibodies and you know phagocytes they are meant to kill specific things they sometimes will kill other things and there are other immune cells that we're going to talk about a little later that can also, because of this immune process, they can then destroy cells surrounding them, which destroys tissues in the body um, and can create other like negative side effects. So there's a lot more here than just saying, oh, these things kill, you know, targeted, it's like, uh, you know, the, the missiles, right? It's like, this is gonna go to this one area and it's only gonna take down this one thing. So like, that's not really how it works. Like there's gonna be destruction in the process and this happens with the immune system as well. Now for a short break to hear a word from our sponsor. We all know by now that fiber is essential for gut health, but for many people, increasing fiber rich foods can lead to more discomfort, more bloating, more gas, and overall frustration. Or the increase in fiber intake becomes difficult to sustain every single day especially when it comes to travel and changes in routines. Today's sponsor, Sun Fiber, can help. Sun Fiber is a prebiotic fiber supplement that is gut-friendly as a soluble, low FODMAP option. Since it mixes into water or food without adding any color, texture, or flavor, that means that you can easily add this into your routine to support your gut without the symptoms. I personally love how easy it is for me to take sun fiber with me when I travel so I can stay consistent with my fiber intake and keep my gut moving. I also feel confident feeding beneficial microbes when I incorporate sun fiber into my daily routine. So whether you use sun fiber daily to support your gut microbiome 
or as needed to keep your fiber intake consistent, this may be a great option that your gut will love. Talk with your trusted healthcare provider to see if this is the right fit for you and then find your favorite Sun Fiber containing products at sunfiber.com. You can also use the code GUT20 to save 20% off your order. And then in addition to some of these major core parts of the immune system, we also have what's called the innate immune system. And this is the body's first line of defense, which includes the physical barriers that are in place in our body. So our skin is one, our mucous membranes and our gut, even just the lining and the GI tract as a whole, the respiratory tract, there's the mucous uh, membrane and the, the lining and smooth muscle itself. And all of those, um, the tight junction proteins and how the, the wall and the cell um, compounds that make up the, the wall structure of the GI tract and the respiratory tract, those are all there to help uh, reduce the amount of pathogens that actually makes their way into the body to cause destruction or harm. So we should have good systems in place with our skin and with our gut, with you know those mucous membranes in order to filter properly and make sure that the things that shouldn't be inside are not inside. And things can go wrong here whenever we have a destruction of the skin. So you're more likely to get an infection if you have a cut, right? We always talk about that, especially in the summer where you get a cut, you don't wanna go jump into a lake full of like lots of bacteria right away, right? Right? or you want to make sure you clean out that cut before and after to reduce infection. Um, same thing's true about the inside of your gut. If you have a lot of destruction to tissue or the mucous membrane has been broken down, which can happen from those pathogenic bacteria in cases like IBS, where we have a dysbiosis of the gut microbiome, then that's going to increase the risk of pathogens getting in where they should not and increase immune responses. All right, so let's narrow in a little bit more on the gut um, because that's our main topic. There's a lot we can cover in terms of the immune system interacting with all systems in the body, but I do want to target the gut because the gut actually houses a significant portion of the human immune system. And it does make sense because the gut is probably more exposed beyond our skin to potential pathogens and antigens from food, drink, and environment that we consume, right? Our gut really does do a lot of that kind of filtering and sensory work when it comes to pathogens that could be present. And so whenever we dig into the gut, um, we there's a few different pieces of the immune system that, that's there. One is called pears patches. These are the small lymphoid nodules that are found in the lining of the small intestine, um, which is in the ileum, so that section of the small intestine. And these patches contain immune cells, which include both B cells and T cells that we already talked about. And this is going to be, this is there really to detect and respond to antigens that are present in the gut and come through the gut. So they're usually there in the small intestine where we are, you know, after we've started absorbing our nutrients, like they're kind of there in, in that process, which is um, important. And so they're, they're there to hopefully get rid of, eliminate, or at least detect um, these pathogens before things move their way to the, the large intestine. If they detect a large amount of pathogens, like what we see with like foodborne illness, sometimes this can lead to like clearing. So we may induce vomiting. If things are a little higher in the ileum, which is the, the end part of the small intestine, we may have vomiting, but often um, this can present as diarrhea because it's every, all the stuff's now moving into the large intestine. So the body may say, Hey, release, get rid of all of this. Um, and there's a big killing process that happens there. There are also gut resident immune cell cells. So outside of the B cells, T cells, there are other immune cells that are specific to the gut, and these can include different macrophages, dendritic cells, other T cells, and these are scattered throughout the gut lining. So these cells are there to just be monitors. So they're looking for threats, any antigens, anything present that needs to be responded to, and then they will typically initiate that response. So beyond those pears patches in the ileum, we also have, you know, immune cells scattered throughout the gut that are there monitoring to make sure we don't miss anything. We also have what are called epithelial cells. So these are actually in the intestinal wall. So they line the intestinal wall and they act as a physical barrier. Whenever we talk about leaky gut, this is where the gut itself and these cells that are supposed to kind of bind together, we call them tight junction proteins or their cells. 
And whenever they are destroyed or they start to lose their binding, usually because of destruction, right? It's like the Red Rover game when we were kids, Red Rover, Red o Rover, right? Something tries to destroy that wall. So these tight junction proteins become weaker. They start to split from each other. And that physical barrier is now broken down and it, you can be at risk for pathogens coming into the body. Um, these cells are also going to help with immune regulation by secreting antimicrobial peptides and they communicate with other immune cells if there's a problem. So what we often see whenever there is that leakiness or increased permeability is what we call it um, in the gut wall in these epithelial cells. When that's happening, you'll see an increase in low grade inflammation and inflammation is the immune response. And so you see that activation of the immune system because that leakiness is occurring, which can be problematic because then we have more cell death um, and we have more symptoms, more issues, and the gut itself becomes more stressed, which allows it to prioritize the immune response, but not necessarily prioritize digestion leading to more symptoms. And then in the gut, we have two other kind of major parts of the immune system. Um, and that is secretory IgA and just the gut microbiota and the gut microbes as a whole. So IgA stands for immunoglobulin A. So it is an antibody um, and it's the most abundant antibody class in the body. A significant portion of it is actually produced by the gastrointestinal tract, and it plays a crucial role in mucosal immunity by neutralizing different pathogens and preventing them from attaching to the intestinal lining. Um, so oftentimes secretory IgA will be measured as a way to measure specifically immune um, reactions in the gut. This is something that we look at in relation to celiac disease, which is an immune reaction to the presence of gluten. Um, and it's considered kind of an immune response, which means we're going to see a rise in this that's produced. Um, and so this will be monitored in those cases, but it can also just be another marker of there's something happening in the gut. There's an immune reaction. Maybe we need to go in and see what's really going on, whether that be food allergies, presence of celiac disease. Sometimes we might see this with IBD, um, but we may also see this with infection or, or something else that's happening. And then your gut microbiota, these microbes are not truly part of the immune system, but they are going to interact with immune cells. And so they can actually regulate and modulate the immune system due to their uh, reaction to antigens, their relationship to the mucosal wall, their relationship to epithelial cells and how they communicate even to immune cells. So microbes and cells are always communicating, uh, which is what we've learned the most probably in the last you know, 25 years of gut microbiome research. All right, so now we're gonna go a little bit deeper. <laughs> There's a lot of information here. So we're gonna go deeper into two specific types of cells that are located mostly in the gut. They're, they're found other places as well, but they're more directly related to digestive disorders, conditions, and gut health. And these are mast cells and eosinophils. So mast cells are white blood cells that are considered true immune cells. So they're found in many tissues, but they're primarily found in connective tissue, including the skin, the respiratory tract, the GI tract, and they're found in those mucosal membranes. So mast cells, they're, think of them kind of like a, an egg, like an Easter egg that houses various inflammatory mediators. So they have histamine, heparin, cytokines, and even proteases inside this little Easter egg. And so whenever mast cells are activated in response to an injury, an infection, a possible allergen, any immune signals that are sent out, they open and then they release what are called these granules, right? These different immune mediators. So it's part of that immune response. That's the inflammation response. And that release of histamine is something that's studied and um, looked at more. It is very common for these mast cells to be what's called dysregulated, meaning they are releasing all of these immune mediators when there's not an actual threat or those signals haven't actually been sent. And this is what we can call mast cell activation disease or mast cell activation syndrome is a common uh, presentation of this. But we also see this in different allergies, asthma, autoimmune disorders, and inflammatory conditions. When it comes to IBS specifically, and some of the newest research that has been developed, 
we see that some with IBS, especially our post-infectious kind of IBSD cases, have lot larger amounts of mast cells in their gut. And not only that, but they have larger amounts of mast cell breakdown, which is likely the key factor that's a problem more than the number of the cells themselves. And so whenever there is an increased rate of mast cell breakdown and we're releasing these mediators, that can lead to increased gut permeability or more of that leakiness. That can also lead to pain due to that process. It can lead to poor digestion, bloating, diarrhea, and things like that. Um, so it can be a major problem. We see in some cases with even utilizing the low FODMAP diet, which is one of the most evidence-based approaches for IBS, that a high FODMAP diet might induce more mast cell breakdown, and then reducing FODMAPs can actually reduce this process. This is something that really does need to be studied more to better understand the role of diet with these cells and what's really going on there. But it's really interesting and can explain why some people with IBS have these histamine-like reactions or the presence of asthma and allergies and even skin reactions. And it, it's, it feels odd, right? Um, whenever you try to put those together because those aren't necessarily just gut symptoms, but when we understand the role of mast cells, it starts to make a lot of sense. Another um, type of immune cell that, that's found in the gut primarily are eosinophils. So these are also white blood cells. And these um, are characterized by the presence of large granules in their cytoplasm. So kind of like an Easter egg again, a bit. Um, and these contain proteins and enzymes. So they're not just mediators, but proteins and enzymes that are there to actually kill off harmful pathogens. That is their goal. So whenever they are produced in the bone marrow and released into the bloodstream, they circulate throughout the body and they go try to find the infections that are present to then kill them off. In healthy cases, they're going to look for parasitic infections. They may be there as a part of the alert allergy response, um, which we can see in those with like asthma and just um, chronic allergies. We see them with the um, inflammation. They produce and release those cytokines that are inflammation. So they're kind of the releasers, if you will, of inflammation. And then they can also help with tissue repair when things are going well. The problem with eosinophils is that whenever there's a large amount of them present, they can, and especially when they're activated, they can kill cells in their surroundings. So cells and tissue. Now this becomes a problem in the gut because the gut is made up of cells and tissue and that cells and tissue really do impact the immune response, digestive um, process and digestion overall. And so we can see in some cases, not necessarily just in IBS, but we may see this in some forms of GERD, but we also see in conditions called eosinophilic conditions. So eosinophilic um, eosophagitis, this is where we have, it's called EOE. We have increased levels of eosinophils and breakdown in the esophagus. We also have EOG, which means increased levels of eosinophils and breakdown in the stomach, which can lead to chronic ulcers and these uh, kind of at food allergies of different parts of the GI tract, um, which is really interesting if you look at that, but we can test for these. And oftentimes the way to reduce them or reduce their um, action is to reduce the pathogens they're going after, which are typically going to be food um, antigens and food allergens, if you will, some of those common allergies. All right, so what does this all mean, right? We know that the immune system and the gut are interconnected and related in many different ways, and that a dysregulation in the gut, like an increased permeability of the gut lining, um, can lead to immune activation and more immune symptoms. We also know that dysregulation of the immune system, their eosinophils and mast cells specifically, can increase um, issues in the gut. This means that whenever we're looking at digestive symptoms, we have to also think deeper than just the symptoms themselves and also think about how we're supporting the immune system and where the immune system may be working against us. Um, and this is a lot easier said than done because it's still something that we don't fully understand, you know, what the relationship is. Testing can be really tricky and difficult um, and not available to everybody, um, especially outside of research purposes. And so treatments aren't really that standardized yet. 
there may be a role in looking at food antigens and reactions to certain foods um, and things that are going on there. There also may be the role of medications that stabilize mast cells. There may be a role in um, antihistamine or allergy medications to help calm things down. There's a lot that we could do and even looking at um, steroids and things like that, that we use for even some other autoimmune conditions, those may be used in the future to calm the immune system down in order to then, you know, build the strength of it back up and get things moving more smoothly. Um, so that's an area to really keep an eye on, especially if you have a lot of these symptoms that seem to overlap and don't hesitate to get more opinions or reach out to a possible immunologist, an allergist, if you feel like you are experiencing the symptoms and you're trying to kind of put those pieces together, an allergist or an immunologist can work really closely with your gastroenterologist to help you get some answers um, and also come up with maybe some unique treatment plans and options for you. As a dietitian on my side, there's not a lot of great evidence around diet for the immune system. We know that a Mediterranean diet and increasing, um, you know, these, these foods that are, we call anti-inflammatory, they don't truly bring down inflammation, but they can help kind of protect the body from the results of that. Um, that may be a helpful approach, you know, reducing foods that possibly could be triggering this or foods that we even, and ingredients that we see that could possibly be problematic and be more pro-inflammatory. Those are things that we might be able to do, um, reducing stress, improving, you know, movement and outdoor time, but like maybe that will help. Um, but we do need more research there to put all of our confidence into those spaces. How I usually like to approach this with clients is making sure we're meeting nutrition needs, that we're resting, that we're giving the body breaks as much as possible and time to heal. And then ideally reducing some of that activation where we can, um, which looks a lot like creativity and your own intuition of your own, of your body and your history and what you've noticed in yourself. So very interested in hearing what you think about this. I know there's so much here. So if you have experience with this or thoughts around this based on your own history that you want to share, um, we'd be happy to hear it. Um, you can reach out on Instagram at erinjudge.rd, tag us um, if you want to share about that. You can also join us in our Facebook community, the gut community, which you'll find in our show notes. And we'd love to talk with you there. So I hope you enjoyed the episode. And next week, we're going to actually go into another complex topic. And that is your thyroid. So join us back here next week and we will keep digging deep. Are you struggling with frustrating GI symptoms, gut issues, or maybe even IBS, and you really need support and guidance from a well-trained, qualified professional? If that is you, the Gut of Eight team of dietitians may be exactly what you are looking for. We personalize every plan for our clients based on their assessment, their medical history, and what actually is working or not working in their body. We do this through close follow-ups every two to three weeks, all virtual. We also do weekly check-ins on every single client, and we are available for our clients through email and messaging support throughout the week and their entire program. Imagine this to be that hand-in-hand -hand care that helps you reach your goals more efficiently, but also with more confidence and knowledge that you can use throughout the rest of your life. If that is what you are looking for, you can start with a consult call where we can talk a bit more about your history, what you're looking for, what you need, and if we can help. You can find the link to schedule a consult call in the show notes if you are interested. We can't wait to talk to you and we hope to work with you to help you reach your goals.